Welcome everyone to the January 11th Hadley School Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call a meeting to order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, we don't have any adjustments to the agenda for tonight, so we will start with public comment. And um, in this digital age, what we've been doing on Zoom is if you do wish to speak to public comment, please raise your digital hand. Um, I do see a hand raised. So as I see this over the um, course of public comment period, I will call on you and ask you to unmute uh, digitally and it should, Zoom should allow you then to unmute and speak. Uh, and we will adhere to our public comment policy which shorthand that uh, other than always being respectful, of course, uh, we also limit our comments to about three minutes just to allow folks time to speak. So I do see uh, Christine Kelly has her hand raised. So I will ask her to unmute. Uh, Christine Kelly, you should Hello. have the floor. Hi, um, I just wanted to say first and foremost, I think that the safety of our kids and staff and community and families should be first and foremost. Uh, I also though wanted to talk about the hardship that being remote puts on our family. And um, I, it has been kind of talked about, but I don't hear it talked about enough. Um, I especially wanna talk about the group that I belong to which is parents of young children who cannot be left alone by themselves and cannot do Zoom by themselves of working parents. So I am in a family with two working parents and a preschooler and a first grader. And I'm sure there are other single parents who are in the same boat that are probably a lot worse off. Um, but in order to try to find childcare, especially in COVID times is pretty much impossible. Um, my husband and I are taking off days of work, using our paid time off to try to watch our children. And we luckily get paid time off. There are sure many people who, when they take a day off, they lose their income. And it has been a struggle. And once we lose all of our paid time off, we go to using the COVID days that the government gave us, but it's only two thirds, excuse me, two thirds of pay. And it's a strain on our businesses. It's a strain on our coworkers. And a lot of people are losing the, leaving the workforce or cutting down a part-time, especially women, unfortunately. It's a majority of women are leaving the workforce right now to watch their children. And that means lack of retirement funds, lack of getting promotions, um, putting a big gap in your resume, which doesn't look good when you try to get rehired. And a lot of us are in fields that you cannot just get rehired if you leave the field. So I just want to emphasize how hard it is for us to be remote when we're trying to work. And so when we think about reopening, please remember that. We got after school taken away from us at like the 11th hour. And that was so horrible. And I have a kid in preschool, which means I can't just have someone take my kid off the bus and bring him to my house. I had to get someone, get them car seats and have them be able to pick up my child and my other child because I couldn't have one be picked up and one get left off at the bus stop. So trying to coordinate this as working families is so difficult. And I know it's difficult for everybody, but this is the group that I belong in. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate you sharing your experiences and your perspective. And I think I speak for all of us that we do want to get the kids back out of remote only and the data unfortunately is really driving that decision. So I look forward to talking through the data again today um, and just wanna reinforce we're committed to reviewing that data um, and continuing to monitor the situation. Uh, um, just for folks who have just joined us, uh, looking for a public comment. I see another public, public comment here. Dan Wilga, I will ask you to unmute. Hi, um, this is actually his wife, Lisa. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because we're having a hard time getting the word out, um, if people finish up with this meeting and want to pop over to the PTO meeting, We'd love to have some um, more Hopkins Academy parents there, some more 
Hadley Elementary School parents there so that we can continue to try to support um, the, the families and the, the school and the teachers and the staff during this difficult time. And so we don't have a great way to get the word out about it. Um, uh, Annie has helped and uh, Jen Dowd, but since I saw a lot of people here and it is at 6.30 this evening, if people are done at this meeting and want to come on over, we'd be very excited to have new people. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Appreciate it. Um, yes, open invitation for folks to join and support um, that group. Uh, again, we are in public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your digital hand. I see uh, Emily Pfeiffer. I will ask you to unmute. Emily? Hi, thanks. Um, it's tough uh, following the the, uh, the earlier comment. I really feel for all the families and, and what they're up against. Um, I'm, I'm here to reiterate my concern about the numbers. They're just going up and up. It's not that they're bad. Well, they are but it's that they're getting worse. And it, it's just, um, it's really concerning for students and for the teachers also. It, it just puts them into that position. So um, I remain hopeful that we can uh, take a renewed focus on the experience of remote and continue to improve it. Um, there's nothing I can offer to someone who literally just can't do their work because their kids are home. I really sympathize with that. It's very, very hard. But um, my hope is that when everyone does go back, those who can and, and choose to, that as many can stay remote do because it keeps everyone who needs to be in the building safer. And we can all make that decision if we're able when we know what that experience is like, we know what to expect, and we know that it's a quality experience. And I know, I mean, April, I know you're working so hard to get clear on it and, and to make sure that we all know what to expect, but at this point, it's still pretty nebulous and there's a lot that's left up to the discretion of the teams and the teachers, which you know, I don't think it should be fully dictated, but guardrails would really help us. If we as families knew we were guaranteed, the kids were guaranteed a certain amount of really live synchronous time, um, or just you know, having a better idea of at a minimum, this is what we can expect. I think it would help those of us who are able to keep our kids home to make that decision to help protect everyone else who has to be in the building. But for now, those numbers are just very scary. And, uh, and I appreciate the decisions we're making now. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I see a hand raised, uh, Sarah. I will ask you to unmute, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Berte. Uh, I recently moved to Hadley just at the beginning of uh, November. Um, and I was just wondering, um, I've looked on the school website a bit, but I was wondering um, if somebody can address or point me to the information about um, why we are tying the you know school opening and closing to the county rate. Um, I know that other schools around are, you know, everybody has their own policies. I was just kind of thinking a little bit about that in the past several weeks and um, curious what the justification and kind of the arguments for it were. Um, so I don't need to spend time getting answers on it now, but if there's uh, some information or resources, that would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Sarah, if you would like to email me directly or, or any one of us, we can point you to a meeting where we deliberated this and tied this to um, metrics and, and including county not just town rates. So please feel free to, if you wouldn't mind, um, shooting us a note via email, and then that way we can uh, point you to the correct materials. Okay, um, for folks who have just joined us, and I we do appreciate everyone's uh, involvement in the meeting. I see um, no other digital hands raised at this point. Again, if you would like to participate in public comment, please raise your digital hand and we can uh, ask you to unmute. I'll just pause to give folks a chance. Okay, uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, coming to the meeting and participating in public comment. 
Uh, we're going to move now into review of the Hopkins Academy Phase Three Transition Plan, which I believe April will be covering. Uh, our fellow committee member, Humera, is in the process of updating her Zoom, which of course decides to update right before a meeting. Uh, that's how it works. So she will join us as soon as she can. Uh, April, the floor is yours. Thanks. So originally in our phase three plan, we had identified two days as a transition for entering phase three and having those two days be time where all of the students remained cohorted and all arrived at once. There were some questions about whether or not that was enough time and, and making sure that we sort of more slowly move into that, which of course, again, was the hope of phase two, but unfortunately families have not chosen to participate that much in phase two. As a result, we came up with a plan, which is a six day transition plan, which has students scaffolded in every day. So it begins with grade seven and then grade eight and grade seven are there, then seven through nine, seven through 10, seven through 11 and seven through 12. So the oldest students are there the least amount of time during this introductory phase and all students during all six of those days remain in the cohort model. They wouldn't begin moving until that seventh day we have a sort of current, you know, projected date of when that could be, but of course we don't know that for sure. That's a little bit dependent on how long we're in remote learning. In this example model, that would start on February 1st. And so students would then start moving through classes on February 9th, only the middle school, so grades seven and eight would move. And then grades nine through 12 would remain cohorted the rest of the week, which would be a Tuesday to Friday or as we said in the original uh, plan, they would have the option of being remote for the remainder of that week. When students do come in on their day, we wanna have them go to the cafeteria where they can stay distanced uh, one grade at a time. So seventh grade comes on that day, that's their assembly day, first thing. We would go through the protocols with them, you know, coming in, washing your hands, how to walk in the hallway, which stairs are up, which are down. This is particularly important for seventh grade who hasn't all been in the school that much this year or some students not at all. So we'd go through all those protocols and then we wanted to have students participate in a team building activity, um, which the, the idea for that particular activity I actually stole from Dr. McKenzie. Um, so it's a small team building activity that involves groups of three to four students, which we would have planned and documented ahead of time. Um, and then the teachers, uh, in order to bring the students down, the teachers would walk their cohort down, they'd go through all of that. Those teachers, assuming that they would normally be teaching that grade would then remain. There's only generally a couple of teachers that that might not be the case. So they would remain to help supervise. And then they would also be dismissed one at a time to then return back, which is how we generally do assemblies. We just usually do it at whole grades at a time. So instead of a whole grade, it would be a, a small cohort at one time um, and we would send them down. The staff did look at this plan. I had 22 staff members who responded to the survey about whether or not they supported the plan. Almost 96% did. So that's 21 out of 22 did support it. The one who said that they did not said that it just wasn't safe to move at all at any point in time. It wasn't particular to this plan. And I did have a couple of teachers who were a little bit concerned about doing the team building activity um, and whether or not we should be and what message that's sending. At the same time, we have some teachers who think it's a great thing to do and that you know, for following all the protocols for shared equipment, um, like we would in, in a club or in athletics practice, that it's something that would be good to do and nice to do with the kids. And of course, that the transition in isn't dependent on that portion. The, the portion I'm most interested in is making sure to go over all of the protocols. That could be done in a big group, that could be done in each cohort. So if that ends up being a piece that people do have concerns about, the, the six days isn't necessarily connected to that. That's just an additional piece to what it is that we're proposing um, for students returning. So that's pretty much it that we came up with. Uh, teachers gave feedback on how long they thought certain things would take. They also gave some feedback on when it might happen. So one of the things to note is that right now, if we were in person next week, I had to think about what day of the week was right now. If we were in person next week, we would normally be able to start moving 
on January 25th. The teachers did have concerns about starting to move and losing that class time during the last couple of days of the quarter. They have their, their lesson plans pretty specifically planned out. So they had some of those concerns, which is why we pushed it to February 1st. Um, so in case you saw that and were wondering, you can also see in the notes, it mentions that high school wouldn't start moving until February 22nd under this plan. That's because of where February break falls. It, it's not pushing it off. It's just like if middle school moves first and then there's break, then they wouldn't move until then. And of course, those dates are just estimates. We haven't asked to move into phase three at, at any particular time. It's just to kind of demonstrate what might happen and how that would look. Um, and you can see in that current plan, which blocks would be affected, what students would miss. Um, and so I'm happy to take questions and comments on that. April, um, you spoke to this, but I think in the team building activity um, that you linked out to here, um, and shared equipment. I mean, I, I'm assuming, does that also include, you know, distancing in terms of, I think, I, you know, when I was reading this, I was thinking back to, you know, the past the marshmallow kind of thing <laughs> that I'm, I'm assuming that it, it's not include, it's not just uh, restricted to shared equipment, but also um, making sure that the space is also adhered to. Yeah, so the cafeteria can fit 65 students at six feet apart. Not, none of our graduating classes are that big. So students, uh, what we would like to do is to separate, have students enter by the co their cohorts. So they're in that cohort area. Within the cohort, we would break them into smaller groups. Students would still sit um, six feet apart. And then in between each cohort, you can also create a little bit more space because there's enough space to work with within that larger space. Um, and then each group would have their own set of materials so that they wouldn't have to share with any other outside groups. So there is obviously more of an element of closeness. Um, and there's obviously times where a student could get closer than six feet if, if one moves forward to do something and another does, and we can't necessarily jump in front of them all immediately. So I think that's where some of the concerns are of, of some of the teachers. Um, and so I guess, you know, as with everything, there's a sort of uh, a cost benefit to look at as to, to whether or not it's the thing to do. And it's also something that could also be discussed as, as things get closer. You know, one of the things we haven't finalized in phase three yet either is which block approach we're using. And one of that reasons is because I really wanna wait until it's closer to the time to move to see what the metrics are like, how much they've gone down or not before we're making the decision about how much movement. So. I mean, that might be another way to look at that piece is, you know, where are things at when that's happening before a final decision is made on that piece. Thank you. Hey, April, thanks, this is Paul. So the, you go through this test period, the, the theoretically, I know it's an example, say start February 1st mm -hmm. and uh, February 8th, it's just cohorted for the middle school. Then we've got uh, a February break. Then it's uh, February 22nd cohorted high school. And then we just, that just starts the alternating high school to middle school, high school to middle school week by week. No, so February, so up until February 8th, everyone's cohorted. The rest of the week of February 8th, the middle school would be moving. The high school would be cohorted. So then the week of the 22nd after break, high school would be moving and middle school would be cohorted. Yeah, sorry, I said that wrong, but is it That's just okay. gonna alternate? Yes, yep, yeah, and then yeah, it would keep okay. alternating. Okay, Do we, and then have we talked about when we would move to a non-alternating fashion? So we haven't, in the original phase three plan, we looked at it as a 10 week block of time. One of the things that I would suggest, uh, obviously no matter what, it's delayed. So the original plan we looked at was phase three being 10 weeks. Then we looked at a potential phase four, which we didn't officially present to you guys or approve, but essentially looked at everyone moving, which would also involve being closer. Uh, and then a, a phase five of a really hopeful everyone can move and be close and maybe extend the day and maybe life is normal, but that, that may or may not happen. When I did talk with a couple of staff members the other day, I did say one of the things we might think about instead, if we didn't want to reduce this space and uh, move everybody might be just moving through more blocks. So in the original phase three, you don't get to a point where you're moving through all of the blocks. We sort of switched 
instead of adding more blocks to just adding uh, more movement. So we haven't made any of those final decisions yet. Um, and I would certainly say as things progress, I would be of the mind of re-looking at the dates and the weeks and how far that's projected out as we're making some of those decisions. So we kind of have the overall model, right, of what it looks like. And I, I think we're probably going to have to come back and get clear about the period of time and the number of blocks as we go forward. Because originally we were looking at January 19th, which we know we're not going to be moving at. I only comment on this. I mean, I think it's a thoughtful approach given what the tools we have now. My hope is that in the next month, the tools change, right? I think if full testing becomes available to us. How does that affect this equation? And then also in the next month or two, hopefully the teachers and the staff are, are vaccinated. I don't see that happening with the kids anytime soon, but so how does that change the equation too? And we don't need to answer that tonight, but just I think those are realistic things to, to hope for, especially the pool testing. And, the, and Annie, you're going to know more about that from the state uh, tomorrow. So I, I don't want to wet ourselves to this and say pool testing, we just add on to this. Pool testing might change how we do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I agree, Paul. I think, I mean, this, this looks like a great uh, outline for where we are now, right? But mm -hmm. as, as Paul was saying, as our tools and our resources and um, uh, shift moving ahead. I think you, you know where our goal is, which is getting back to as much of a sense of normal as we can, it, you know, keeping health and safety ob obviously in the forefront. So we're committed to continuing to review what the next and subsequent, uh, you know, steps will be as our tools and our resources shift and change, hopefully for the better. Um, thanks for this plan, April, and sorry, team, that I was delayed. It, sometimes Zoom just does not play well. In fact, after um, updating and trying to reboot, I just decided to grab someone else's computer, and so that's why I'm here. Sorry about that. Missed it the first 10 minutes. Um, but the only thing I wanted to add about the plan, um, having done the Marshmallow Challenge a number of times and, and seeing how two or three students might hold up things while a third person, fourth person put something on top. Um, there's a number of team building design or oriented um, uh, co team collaboration fun activities. Um, I have a whole deck that I'm happy to share with you the digital equivalent of that if you want to look for some alternatives that have students more spaced out. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Like I said, a couple of the staff members um, weren't entirely thrilled about that piece. And that's why I said before that, you know, the, the assembly and the specific components and working that out, we can obviously continue to look at and, and might be dependent on where life is at the time. Um, so I'm certainly happy to follow up with you, Humira, about some ideas for that as well. Cool. You just need those super large, like extra large marshmallows so that you don't need a kid holding them up. Just <laughs> stick the spaghetti in and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> Sorry, Tara, go ahead. Um, oh, it's okay. I'm not gonna lie. I have no idea what the marshmallow challenge is. So I have some pretty good envisionments, but I'm sure I'm far off from what it really is. So maybe you can send me a note later and let me know. But um, so I had um, just two things that I had wanted to say, and I thank you for taking the time to um, go through this with staff and take the time to really um, think about the safest way that we can get the kids back in school. And I know that there is a strong push from parents and students um, that they really wanna come back in and they'd like to come back in as normal as they possibly can. So I appreciate your time and your effort. Um, two things that I wanna say is that it, um, my understanding is that we've, you know, we've kind of approved the phase three as is, and this is coming back just for the transition plan. So if there's any major changes to phase three as whatever changes along the way, I'm gonna leave it really big like that. Whatever may change in the future, if there's any major changes, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna guess that that would be brought back to us, but I would ask that it would be brought back to us. Um, and then the only other thing that I, I would say is, um, you know, numbers are increasing. <clears throat> and I think we need to remain as safe as possible. And I still stand that I think it's really important um, to 
um, ensure that we're really only changing one thing at a time. So I understand that it's kind of out of our control where students are gonna be on their off weeks, but I would really strongly encourage um, parents and the students who are choosing to come back for phase three to be present um, that first week or that second week back in school. So the high school, the second week back in the week of, of um, February 8th after that initial day that everybody's back in the school. As many people as possible in the building without much movement, um, just to ensure that as we're changing all these variables, we're able to control as much as we can. So as many people in the building as we can get before we start moving around would, would help us, to be honest. Um, so as many as you know are willing to come back, it looks like it's only four days at this point, right? Because, well, I guess technically five, but four days for the middle school to shift. So if we can just get everybody back in the building safely, know that that goes okay. Um, I, I, I'd like to see us transition and move through this phase seamlessly um, and as safely as possible. I, I really, really would. That's all I have. I, I, I think I'm kind of on board with everybody in what they've said so far. I think April, this is a, a solid transition into phase three. I'm hopeful that we can get there sooner rather than later. Um, I think I'll, I'll just echo what Tara said. I, I just want to encourage families in the community to take advantage of this transition plan um, as an opportunity to get everybody on the same page. Again, if we're going to be bringing more people into the building than before, um, it is going to be a change for, for the, the students that are already in the building, for the, the teachers and the administrators that are there. And it's going to be a, obviously a change for, for the new students. Um, and I think that this time will allow everybody to kind of get comfortable with the protocols and everything like that. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm really thankful for this plan to be laid out the way it is. I'm excited to get these kids back in the building. I, I obviously hope that it's sooner rather than later and that the metrics kind of work the way we want them to work. So this, this looks good to me. All right, any other questions or um, requests for April? If not on this plan, April, would you mind? I know you sent something home today, I think, but um, it's wonderful what you and your team have done, the resource that you're doing for parents on uh, educating them about resources that have to do with substance abuse. So do you mind just announcing that? I know it's been in your newsletter and other places, but I appreciate um, what you're doing and what your team is doing to try to help families. Sure. So we've been working with the counselor, school nurse, and school resource officer for the last few months, planning a community forum, which is open not just to, to families in Hadley, but to, to any families who would like to join so that we can help give families information about substance abuse, um, what it looks like, causes, how to deal with that. We're going to have a guest speaker who's a licensed counselor in drug and alcohol who can also speak and share some information around that, as well as the connection between substance abuse and mental health. Um, and then there'll be a period at the end to ask him questions if people want to ask our guest speaker questions. So um, our staff will present and then he will. We know that especially in light of COVID, this has become an increased issue and, you know, in kind of two different ways. So it increased use uh, students uh, or people who are abusing substances are more likely to um, be impacted more by COVID. And then we know within our own community, which our school resource officer will discuss that unfortunately there are some um, teenagers and I'm sure college age kids who are also still gathering to partake in substances. And that of course is only going to increase spreading COVID in our community. So we are hopeful that we can provide some information for people about some different areas and then some potential resources. It's all virtual and it's February 9th at 6.30. I did add an event posting to the Facebook page and there's also information on the website as well. Thanks, April. I really appreciate you and everybody at Hopkins doing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to that session. Um, all right. We're going to move then into the review of the public health data. 
uh, and there's a link here in our agenda to the latest uh, iteration of our weekly dashboard data. I will take um, this opportunity to just address the question we received in public comment from Sarah, at least um, initially, and we will we will again um, point you towards the de deliberations around this. But some of the underlying reasons around considering data beyond just our town data had to do with uh, the fact that we do have um, you know a, a proportion of our students that are school choice uh, in they come from other uh, areas not Hadley um, we also have uh, uh, staff who are not necessarily living in Hadley and so as part of our discussion and concern about the low numbers that we might see within Hadley given just the small population of our town um, when we set our metrics, we did discuss uh, using both of those uh, county data as well as town data. So there was also more to it than just that. Uh, and you can see uh, historically back in November when we started approaching, you know, the, the orange warning area within the county numbers, that alone did not um, precipitate us moving into a remote model. So uh, we had some dialogue at earlier meetings about um, having two out of our three real uh, flagged areas uh, sending us into a remote model or, or causing us to examine what our next steps were. Does anybody want to add anything to that in terms of framing uh, and the fuller picture that we're trying to get here? I would just add also when we reached out to uh, the Harvard School of Public Health they recommended that we have a minimum in of 100,000, which means Hadley never would have made that. Hampshire County is 160,000. And so um, in terms of looking at average daily incidents and testing positivity in a meaningful way. Yeah, thanks Annie for that reminder. All right, so we see where we are as of Thursday evening's numbers. Um, cases in terms of total count for uh, the town have gone up. Um, uh, case count last 14 days. Uh, you can see that that's holding fairly steady at 44. Um, and then our average daily incidence rate and percent positivity rate, um, we've gone you know, up into 4.78. So we're still in the red in terms of these uh, local and county numbers. And in terms of school transmission, I believe we are still at zero. Obviously we've been remote. Annie, you sent out updates as uh, cases have been, have, have been identified that, you know, with information that can be shared. But I think based on this data, there, we're not seeing really any change for the better since the prior week. And you did make the decision, um, Annie, and you communicated this out about remote this week. That's correct. And the data for county positivity is now the county data that we make our decision on based on is actually published on Wednesday night, which is good. The school data and the individual town data won't come out until Thursday, but the county data comes out Wednesday. Thank you very much, Frank McInerney, for pointing that out to me and uh, bringing it to my attention. I appreciate it. So we will know on Wednesday evenings. Um, what the county transmission rates are. I uh, am always hoping for the best. People know that um, I, I do want school available for children and families. However, uh, realistically, the, the daily increases in Hampshire County, if you look at DPH's interactive COVID-19 dashboard, I believe on Saturday there were 96 new cases and on Sunday there were additional 64 new cases. So everything, anything we can all do to continue to, to, to wear our masks and stay socially distanced or physically distanced and do everything we can to contribute to a reduction of transmission in the county. It just, it's going to take all of us. And I know people are trying and I know they're tired, um, but we just have to keep, we just have to keep trying. Hey, Annie, did you get a chance? There's the CDC uh, guidelines, the, the, the thresholds. You've been updating those. Did you have a chance to, to look at those again and update it with the latest information? Uh, I will add to, I, I will add 
the one, the January dates. I don't have those there, Paul, but I will make sure that I do that. And that is on the last tab. So just a reminder to the public, um, I copy out some of the graphs into the newsletter every week. But if you want to look at this, um, it's available uh, to the public. Um, and um, the link is in the newsletter each week to get to the entire all tabs in the workbook. And I did add, uh, it's easier to see here, Humera, you had suggested, uh, which was a very good suggestion that we add, all the districts highlighted in blue are in the sports bubble. And the reason that you only see data, the last two columns here is because I didn't go back. I just started tracking it after that suggestion, but that's the athletic bubble that you'd ask for data on. Great, um, thank you for that. And I know it's a lot of data to keep track of on top of everything else you do. Thank you, Annie, for that. Um, going back to the main one, um, I, I think the, um, yeah, the first, the very first, and it gets lost in there. The one with the two line charts. And then the orange going to red. Yeah, there it is. Um, thank you for updating this. I believe the um, columns A through E are accurate. It is possible that the line charts themselves, however, are not. If I look at the the data points, um, I think the data points may be from. Yeah, I may not have updated that chart there, which I'll make sure that I do. I actually have that in a separate Excel spreadsheet. So it doesn't, it's not linked to this Google spreadsheet and I copied it in. So I'll make sure that I update the, the chart. These, this table, you're absolutely right, Humara. I believe I don't have the 34 and the 4.78. So those just need to be added. And I probably need to drop the data at the beginning because it's coming to a point where it's hard to read. Right, that's what you've noticed here, is that I see that now too. I need to make sure I update yeah, the line and chart. And the, the purple line chart as well. Yeah, yeah. so I'll make sure they're in a separate workbook. I'll make sure that I do that and then I copy in the right images. Appreciate it. Andy, is there anything about the um, uh, announcement around testing and public schools, uh, what Paul had alluded to earlier, that I know there's more information forthcoming, but anything you'd like to share tonight in terms of what we know at this point? Just that I will be at a webinar tomorrow. Uh, at least one of the school nurses, maybe both of our school nurses will be on that webinar also. Um, there's also an RN in the community, a parent who's offered to uh, provide any help that she can, uh, but this will be to learn about um, pool testing, which we've talked about before. So it's not individual testing where a group sample is taken. The state is looking to make pool testing available to schools and to districts at no cost. And I believe that um, they anticipate doing that in very short order. I'll have more information after I go to the webinar tomorrow and I will update the committee at our next meeting and the public as well. Great, thank you. And I'm assuming there is still no kind of, you know, target uh, date for the next phase of vaccinations involving uh, educators? No, uh, nothing. We haven't been informed that anything has changed. So again, group one, healthcare workers. Um, originally, group two, the top of the list of essential workers included public safety. Um, Public safety was not included in group one. And as uh, many of you know, beginning January 11th, today, right? Um, public safety first responders um, were going to start getting their vaccines. I know of one, uh, actually the spouse of one of our teachers who's a first responder who did get their vaccine today. So that makes me very hopeful that it would appear in that regard that we're a bit ahead of schedule. I, I hope I'm correct in that. And um, then we'll just wait with uh, just wait with hope. A couple of things that I'm hearing from outside of um, our community is that nationally, um, if they're uh, in, for folks who don't show up uh, in the numbers that they expected in phase one, uh, they are making the recommendation that um, 
the states do what um, Florida has done, which is to move systematically down the list of phase two, three, four. Um, and I understand that New York is following suit and I don't know what's happening in Massachusetts, but I just heard that today on the news and I thought I'd mention that in, in the event that um, there's a queue and we can be aware um, because as you know, if these, uh, some of these vaccines are not refrigerated, they go, they go bad. And so they're saying to people, uh, they're saying to some elderly uh, in, in different communities that, you know, call and, and see if it is, if, if there happens to be vaccine available. Um, I just, I put that out there in the event, just to keep our eye on that. It seems to be a fast moving situation. The other thing that seems to be an emergent situation, and, and the New York Times has an excellent podcast on this today, as a matter of fact, is that the British, British variant of the um, coronavirus um, has an R naught of 1.5 versus the whatever the original was. Tara, you would probably know more. I think it's one or something. Um, it, it's significantly more alarming because it's significantly more contagious, apparently. Um, but I highly recommend that you check out that podcast if you're interested in um, what they're recommending. Um, in other countries, they are uh, testing for that variant. In the US, I don't believe they're testing for that variant. And it's um, been found in at least two or three states. Um, and I'd be surprised if it's not in Massachusetts already. I just have a comment on a more local note to kind of tie in with um, Himera, I had saw this and I had meant to email you, Annie, or maybe you sent it out. The um, town of Hadley is doing a COVID Q&A on, hold on, I have it on my phone, it just closed. On Wednesday, January 13th at 5.30, they're doing a virtual Q&A on Zoom. Um, they're going to have it recorded with Hadley Media. Um, and if you're unable to attend it and you want to submit your questions ahead of time, you can submit it to the um, Hadley Board of Health as well. So if people are looking just to get a little bit more of information from um, our local town officials about COVID, there might, might be able to find out some information in general about vaccinations or testing available or whatnot. It might be a good place to go. So that was Wednesday, January 13th at 5.30 on Zoom. I know it's on Facebook. Um, it's also in the last newsletter. I'm glad you brought this up because I'm speaking at it. So I'm glad you reminded me of that. <laughs> so it's in the uh, it's in the newsletter, the most recent newsletter from me toward the bottom. There's a link to um, more information about it uh, with the Zoom link as well. Perfect. Hey, Annie, I, I'm not sure if it was, I think it was you that had sent out this website, the covidschool dashboard.com, the Brown University researchers who are collecting school data around the country been spending yeah. some time on that. And, um, you know, I know I bring this up every meeting and I'll bring it up again. I do, I know the numbers are rising and I am concerned about the variant that uh, Humara mentioned. I do think that there's something special about schools um, that the data are just showing. If we, if we really are dis data driven, um, the data are pretty significant based on, if you look at school, COVID school dashboard.com, you know, they've been collecting data from across the country. I think they don't have complete sets from, they have sets from New York and Texas, but incomplete sets from many states, including 12 states. Um, and boy, the, just the numbers, for example, they have a lot of, you know, tens of thousands of kids that are out there in hybrid and in-person models. And the rates in high school, for example, of students, or let's take elementary of COVID cases related to the number of kids that have been in hybrid or uh, in person, um, you know, zero, 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 one percent rates of infection, just dramatically low. And I think about it, I don't know if it was the Adesi the, uh, person who had said, you know, schools are probably some of the safest places for our kids to be. And just thinking about what one of the parents had said earlier about the struggles of maintaining young children at home. Is there any way we could see ourselves, uh, you know, going to not the lowest of that CDC risk category, which is what the 3% is, but the, the lower risk, which is three to 5% incident rate where we are now and saying, you know, it's so essential for our community and for our kids to be there at that younger age to get in there because all the data seem to be saying just across the country that schools, if you run them well, like I know we do and we would, that we they're probably the safest place for our kids to be plus 
the complementary educational and social, uh, social benefits. You know, the doubling of the children failing, the quadrupling of the Fs that we're seeing, increased suicidal thoughts across the country, you know, all that sort of adds up to, and just not the increase of the risk in, in our schools. That's what gets me. I know there's a lot of concern about the community rise, and of course it makes logical sense to say community rise equals rise in schools, but you gotta follow the data and the data just aren't showing that. I don't know, Annie, if you have a different opinion, you know these data better than anybody, but I look at the website, man, these risks are, you, you have more risk driving to school than you do getting COVID, right? And just the benefits of our kids being in schools is so essential. And I know we'd have to talk to the teachers, but I just think, especially, you know, the high school kids, it's tough, they can figure it out. It sounds like April's got a good plan to get us back. But boy, the elementary schools are so tough on them. It's so tough on the parents, it's so tough on the community. Can't we, I would argue that we could be, get to that lower risk category, uh, not the lowest risk category, the one that's in sort of light green there and say, that's where we can accept risk because we can manage the other risk. And we just across this region and that data you're showing, no schools are really seeing in-school transmission, just nothing. And you're not seeing that really to any significant degree across the country. I just feel like we, we can be safe and have our kids in school, even as the, we're concerned about what's happening in the community. I really would advocate that we do because I think it's so essential for our kids. And so I know we're all afraid because the community numbers are going up. Yeah. So Paul, just because you had asked if I had any thoughts on that. First, I want to say thank you. I want to thank every single school committee member. I am so appreciative of um, how thoughtful each one of you is, how I think every person not uh, doesn't focus on representing their personal perspective, but representing the perspective of a constituent group as well as their own thinking on this. Um, and just as there is in the school committee, obviously a, a range of thinking about this, we know that's true in the community as well. And I appreciate the fact that um, you advocate for folks um, who are really feeling like schools absolutely must be open. And I appreciate um, that we have folks who are, are representing the position of, whoa, we really, we wanna make sure that we are as careful as we possibly can be. So when you, if you're asking me what, it, everyone knows I'm a huge proponent of opening schools. I haven't, I haven't hid that. So people know where I stand on this, where I've stood on this since August. And now when I look at these data, um, what's happening in the county, and I understand what you're saying, Paul, about um, just because county transmission rates start to increase exponentially, that does not necessarily mean that we would see the same rate of transmission in the schools. But some of the studies that were included in that really big document I sent you guys, that 172 page document that was Mass General and other hospitals have put together and medical doctors have put together, um, that, that, uh, brought together a lot of different research. The, when rates increase in the community, so school, the fear that schools would drive up community transmission, although there's two recent studies that are saying, do things look different in communities where colleges were open? Now I'm just talking K-12 schools, right? So if people are thinking about, well, this new research came out, I'm focused on K-12 schools right now. And to your point, Paul, the fear that opening K-12 schools would drive up rates of community transmission, that does not seem to have been something that occurred. Certainly when we first opened, sc opened schools, what we were seeing in terms of community transmission was a very, very different picture, right? What we were looking at in terms of community transmission. But there are studies that also say that but community transmission can have an effect on the schools, that when COVID is running rampant in the community, it is much more likely that it will be introduced in the school. Once introduced in the school, the mitigation strategies may prevent it from spreading, but the likelihood of introduction goes up. That's just logical. What I struggle with, and this is not minimized, 
it really, my heart really does break. I, I can't stand the fact that I, I feel as though I am wildly disappointing many, many families. That does not make me happy. It doesn't make me feel good. But even if school, even if once introduced into the school setting, it's unlikely that COVID would spread, the increased likelihood of introduction, I, I also struggle greatly with the idea of increasing the risk that that faculty and staff are exposed to. And, um, and I know, Paul, you are not suggesting that you're comfortable with, uh, with irresponsibly increasing risks. That's not, you're not saying that. I'm not implying that you're saying that. Um, but that if you're asking me, I can, I don't see these two things as just either or, nor am I implying that you're simply saying it that way. Community, community of transmission increases it's more likely that community transmission will introduce COVID into the school setting. Our mitigation strategies may very well prevent it from spreading in the schools. Once I start ratcheting up the risk of exposure and the people who are most, li or, are most likely to, who will most likely suffer the greatest, have the greatest risk when it comes to exposure are the adults in the building. I, I really struggle with that. And I really struggle when I, when I see the rate of increase. Um, I am hoping, as Pollyanna as it sounds, I am hoping beyond hope that young people, that adults, we can do something, we know that, we've seen the ability of people to flatten curves, that we all exercise our personal responsibility and do everything that it takes so that we can keep our communities open without requiring people to withstand um, essentially unnecessary risk. I mean, this rate of increase is directly related to people exercising disregard for really sound recommendations on how to conduct themselves in general. I'm not calling out any individuals or any such thing. So, so that would be my response to what, what my thoughts are. And as I said, everyone knows, you know, I, I'd love to see schools open. I don't like the fact that in some ways I feel like I'm disappointing children who want to be back in school, that I'm creating hardship for parents. Um, but um, that's, that's where I stand in this moment. And uh, it's difficult and it's complicated, but those are my thoughts. And thank you for asking me. Yeah, no, that's great, Annie. You're, you're so thoughtful about this. I appreciate it. But what gets me, and, and I wish, and, and maybe there's a study out there or, or some good thinker that I just don't know on this is that even the CDC, the DESE, the Harvard guidelines, these are six, seven months old. We're a heck of a lot smarter, right? And even looking at that COVID school dashboard site, and it's frankly, it's not the easiest to use. So I don't know if I'm ex understanding it fully exactly as, as I could, but they have some counties, some that are triple our rates of incidence and the in-school transmission rate is 0.5%. It's, you know, it's less than one. And the, the teacher, the, the staff rate is higher, one or 2%. So there is some difference there between adults and students that they're finding. But I just, that, and I'm not saying, you know, we ask like kids back in when we're at 13%, like some of these Texas counties are. Um, but geez, it just seems like there is flexibility here and we can be smarter just because the, the county is rising doesn't necessarily equate to risk in school because the data just don't, it's a, it's a logical conclusion, but you have to follow the data. And I just haven't seen where the data proved that to be true in every case. And so while at a certain point you have to disregard what seems logical but unproven and follow what's proven. I don't know, do you know of another study or another expert that we can talk to that would say, yeah, this was this made sense by the CDC and DESE and Harvard seven months ago, but it's just not corroborated by the evidence anymore. So I can resend and I can also include a link to it in the newsletter. Can I, did I do this right? I'm unmuted, um, correct? There you are. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's in that um, big document you sent a long time ago. Yeah, but I can also, I just so the public can see it too, I can include it in the next newsletter because that is regularly updated. So they add yeah. to it. So, and, and actually this came up when we uh, referred to it as school committee meeting. I think somebody thought that the highlights in the document were highlights I had made. No, they highlighted to show what's new, what they've added. Um, so I'll, um, I'll resend the link and I'll also share the link with the public. Um, I'm not saying that's the be all end all, but it's pretty exhaustive. 
it's not a political document. It's put together by um, uh, medical professionals, physicians, and like I said, it's Mass General and I forgot the other hospital that was behind it. Um, so I can share that again as well. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I do think our best way out of this is uh, a good testing protocol and a good vaccination protocol. And I'll say, I know I'd mentioned this last week, I haven't been able to reconnect with um, UMass on the testing. I, I had been pushing sort of mid last week, but then the state's proposed testing, uh, you know, um, pool testing protocol came out and, and Annie and I chatted. I'm not sure exactly how to, what to do with that now. I mean, I, I don't know if it's worth pursuing something with UMass now, um, if the state's gonna step in. Hopefully we'll know more what the state is actually offering and whether we're, we qualify for it. It sounds like the state is gonna prioritize schools that are in-person and hybrid, which we are. So I would argue you know, we should be prioritized for that. Yeah, so I'll make sure in the newsletter this weekend that I include that um, kind of compilation of research document. I'll resend it to the school committee and, and uh, share it with families. I will also uh, update the community in that newsletter on um, what I learned tomorrow and if there's any recordings of it or a slide deck, I'll link that in the newsletter as well. And I'll touch base with you tomorrow if there's still a value of pursuing UMass. I can, sure. I can do that. I would suggest, Paul, and I really appreciate you um, cultivating the relationship with UMass. You know, anything can go wrong as with right. Uh, politics, right? It just makes sense to hedge our bets and cultivate that relationship. And um, if they're um, if they're ready to try something, I I think it would be worth being ready ourselves to do yeah. what needs to be done. I agree with that, Amara. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there anything else on the review of public health data then for tonight? Not Great. For Great, and thank you, Annie, for those um, inclusions that you'll have in your newsletter for this week. Uh, before we adjourn the meeting, any other announcements for tonight? You know, we've shared about, um, April shared about the session for um, uh, substance abuse uh, session and uh, information was shared. Tara, you shared the information about the uh, Board of Health session this Wednesday. Anything else? I would love to share information um, about the um, next Hadley Learns um, meeting. And um, so uh, last Thursday or the Thursday before, um, I mentioned that we were having our first um, jet it was a two-part series. January, people were learning about the history of, uh, of racism in our nation uh, with uh, podcasts and um, movies. And that was a, um, a wonderful event. Um, we had some great comments from folks saying, gosh, in the, in the 25 years I've lived here in Hadley, I've never gotten to know um, as many people as I have, um, except through Hadley Learns just a nice community to meet and discuss. Um, but I wanted to make the announcement that the two-part series, um, February, we're discussing um, teaching and learning and um, race issues in teaching and learning. And um, a lot of it has to do with social emotional um, connection with students. Um, and in light of the conversation we had last month about social, the importance of social emotional connection, I think anyone who wanted to attend to learn about that and also learn about culturally responsive pedagogy um, should sign up. Go to hadleylearns.com and uh, just sign up in the events section. And there's um, a, a bunch of video um, resources. Watch one and come ready to learn about the other ones through what other people watched and get to know some more folks. Um, so I highly recommend it. Thanks, Yumara. Any other announcements or information sharing for tonight? Okay. Nice to see you all again. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. See you all again real soon. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, Bye guys. Good night.